Introduction Every human society must justify its inequalities. Unless reasons for them are found, the whole political and social edifice stands in danger of collapse. Every epoch, therefore, develops a range of contradictory discourses and ideologies for the purpose of legitimizing the inequality that already exists or that people believe should exist. From these discourses emerge certain economic, social, and political rules, which people then use to make sense of the ambient social structure. Out of the clash of contradictory discourses, a clash that is at once economic, social, and political, comes a dominant narrative or narratives which bolster the existing inequality regime. In today's societies, these justificatory narratives comprise themes of property, entrepreneurship, and meritocracy. Modern inequality is said to be just because it is the result of a freely chosen process in which everyone enjoys equal access to the market and to property, and automatically benefits from the wealth accumulated by the wealthiest individuals, who are also the most enterprising, deserving, and useful. Hence, modern inequality is said to be diametrically opposed to the kind of inequality found in pre-modern societies, which was based on rigid, arbitrary, and often despotic differences of status. The problem is that this proprietarian and meritocratic narrative, which first flourished in the 19th century after the collapse of the old regime and its society of orders, and which was radically revised for a global audience at the end of the 20th century following the fall of Soviet communism and the triumph of hypercapitalism, is looking more and more fragile. From it, a variety of contradictions have emerged, contradictions which take very different forms in Europe and the United States, in India and Brazil, in China and South Africa, in Venezuela and the Middle East. And yet today, two decades into the 21st century, the various trajectories of these different countries are increasingly interconnected, their distinctive individual histories notwithstanding. Only by adopting a transnational perspective can we hope to understand the weaknesses of these narratives and begin to construct an alternative. Indeed, socioeconomic inequality has increased in all regions of the world since the 1980s. In some cases, it has become so extreme that it is difficult to justify in terms of the general interest. Nearly everywhere, a gaping chasm divides the official meritocratic discourse from the reality of access to education and wealth for society's least favored classes. The discourse of meritocracy and entrepreneurship often seems to serve primarily as a way for the winners in today's economy to justify any level of inequality whatsoever while peremptorily blaming the losers for lacking talent, virtue, and diligence. In previous inequality regimes, the poor were not blamed for their own poverty, or at any rate, not to the same extent. Earlier justificatory narratives stressed instead the functional complementarity of different social groups. Modern inequality also exhibits a range of discriminatory practices based on status, race, and religion. Practices pursued with a violence that the meritocratic fairy tale utterly fails to acknowledge. In these respects, modern society can be as brutal as the pre-modern societies from which it likes to distinguish itself. Consider, for example, the discrimination faced by the homeless, immigrants, and people of color. Think, too, of the many migrants who have drowned while trying to cross the Mediterranean. Without a credible new universalistic and egalitarian narrative, it is all too likely that the challenges of rising inequality, immigration, and climate change will precipitate a retreat into identitarian nationalist politics based on fears of a great replacement of one population by another. We saw this in Europe in the first half of the 20th century, and it seems to be happening again in various parts of the world in the first decades of the 21st century.
It was World War I that spelled the end of the so-called Belle Epoque, 1880 to 1914, which was Belle only when compared with the explosion of violence that followed. In fact, it was Belle primarily for those who owned property, especially if they were white males. If we do not radically transform the present economic system to make it less inegalitarian, more equitable, and more sustainable, xenophobic populism could well triumph at the ballot box and initiate changes that will destroy the global hyper-capitalist digital economy that has dominated the world since 1990. To avoid this danger, historical understanding remains our best tool. Every human society needs to justify its inequalities, and every justification contains its share of truth and exaggeration, boldness and cowardice, idealism and self-interest. For the purposes of this book, an inequality regime will be defined as a set of discourses and institutional arrangements intended to justify and structure the economic, social, and political inequalities of a given society. Every such regime has its weaknesses. In order to survive, it must permanently redefine itself, often by way of violent conflict, but also by availing itself of shared experience and knowledge. The subject of this book is the history and evolution of inequality regimes. By bringing together historical data bearing on societies of many different types, societies which have not previously been subjected to this sort of comparison, I hope to shed light on ongoing transformations in a global and transnational perspective. From this historical analysis, one important conclusion emerges. What made economic development and human progress possible was the struggle for equality and education and not the sanctification of property, stability, or inequality. The hyper-inegalitarian narrative that took hold after 1980 was in part a product of history, most notably the failure of communism. But it was also the fruit of ignorance and of disciplinary division in the academy. The excesses of identity politics and fatalist resignation that plague us today are in large part consequences of that narrative's success. By turning to history from a multidisciplinary perspective, we can construct a more balanced narrative and sketch the outlines of a new participatory socialism for the 21st century. By this, I mean a new universalistic egalitarian narrative, a new ideology of equality, social ownership, education, and knowledge and power sharing. This new narrative presents a more optimistic picture of human nature than did its predecessors, and not only more optimistic, but also more precise and convincing because it is more firmly rooted in the lessons of global history. Of course, it is up to each of us to judge the merits of these tentative and provisional lessons, to rework them as necessary, and to carry them forward. What is an ideology? Before I explain how this book is organized, I want to discuss the principal sources on which I rely and how the present work relates to capital in the 21st century. But first, I need to say a few words about the notion of ideology as I use it in this study. I use ideology in a positive and constructive sense to refer to a set of a priori plausible ideas and discourses describing how society should be structured. An ideology has social, economic, and political dimensions. It is an attempt to respond to a broad set of questions concerning the desirable or ideal organization of society. Given the complexity of the issues, it should be obvious that no ideology can ever command full and total assent. Ideological conflict and disagreement are inherent in the very notion of ideology. Nevertheless, every society must attempt to answer questions about how it should be organized, usually on the basis of its own historical experience, but sometimes also on the experiences of other societies. Individuals will usually also feel called on to form opinions of their own on these fundamental existential issues, however vague or unsatisfactory they may be.
What are these fundamental issues? One is the question of what the nature of the political regime should be. By political regime, I mean the set of rules describing the boundaries of the community and its territory, the mechanisms of collective decision-making, and the political rights of members. These rules govern forms of political participation and specify the respective roles of citizens and foreigners, as well as the functions of executives and legislators, ministers and kings, parties and elections, empires and colonies. Another fundamental issue has to do with the property regime, by which I mean the set of rules describing the different possible forms of ownership, as well as the legal and practical procedures for regulating property relations between different social groups. Such rules may pertain to private or public property, real estate, financial assets, land or mineral resources, slaves or serfs, intellectual and other immaterial forms of property, and relations between landlords and tenants, nobles and peasants, masters and slaves, or shareholders and wage earners. Every society, every inequality regime, is characterized by a set of more or less coherent and persistent answers to these questions about its political and property regimes. These two sets of answers are often closely related because they depend in large part on some theory of inequality between different social groups, whether real or imagined, legitimate or illegitimate. The answers generally imply a range of other intellectual and institutional commitments. For instance, commitments to an educational regime, that is, the rules governing institutions and organizations responsible for transmitting spiritual values, knowledge, and ideas, including families, churches, parents, and schools and universities, and a tax regime, that is, arrangements for providing states or regions, towns or empires, and social, religious, or other collective organizations with adequate resources. The answers to these questions can vary widely. People can agree about the political regime but not the property regime, or about certain fiscal or educational arrangements but not others. Ideological conflict is almost always multidimensional, even if one axis takes priority for a time, giving the illusion of majoritarian consensus allowing broad collective mobilization and historical transformations of great magnitude. Borders and Property To simplify, we can say that every inequality regime, every inegalitarian ideology, rests on both a theory of borders and a theory of property. The border question is of primary importance. Every society must explain who belongs to the human political community it comprises and who does not, what territory it governs under what institutions, and how it will organize its relations with other communities within the universal human community, which, depending on the ideology involved, may or may not be explicitly acknowledged. The border question and the political regime question are, of course, closely linked. The answer to the border question also has significant implications for social inequality, especially between citizens and non-citizens. The property question must also be answered. What is a person allowed to own? Can one person own others? Can he or she own land, buildings, firms, natural resources, knowledge, financial assets, and public debt? What practical guidelines and laws should govern relations between owners of property and non-owners? How should ownership be transmitted across generations? Along with the educational and fiscal regime, the property regime determines the structure and evolution of social inequality. In most pre-modern societies, the questions of the political regime and the property regime are intimately related. In other words, power over individuals and power over things are not independent. Here, things refers to possessed objects, which may be persons in the case of slavery. Furthermore, power over things may imply power over persons. This is obviously true in slave societies, where the two questions essentially merge into one. Some individuals own others and therefore also rule over them.
The same is true, but in more subtle fashion, in what I call ternary or trifunctional societies. That is, societies divided into three functional classes, a clerical and religious class, a noble and warrior class, and a common and laboring class. In this historical form, which we find in most pre-modern civilizations, the two dominant classes are both ruling classes, in the senses of exercising the regalian powers of security and justice, and property-owning classes. For centuries, the landlord was also the ruler, seigneur, of the people who lived and worked on his land, just as much as he was the seigneur, lord of the land itself. By contrast, ownership, or proprietarian societies of the sort that flourished in Europe in the 19th century, drew a sharp distinction between the property question, with universal property rights theoretically open to all, and the power question, with a centralized state claiming a monopoly of regalian rights. The political regime and the property regime were nevertheless closely related, in part because political rights were long restricted to property owners, and in part because constitutional restrictions then and now severely limited the possibility for political majorities to modify the property regime by legal and peaceful means. As we shall see, Political and property regimes have remained inextricably intertwined from pre-modern ternary and slave societies to modern post-colonial and hyper-capitalist ones, including along the way the communist and social democratic societies that arose in reaction to the crises of inequality and identity that ownership society provoked. To analyze these historical transformations, I therefore rely on the notion of an inequality regime, which encompasses both the political regime and the property regime, as well as the educational and fiscal regimes, and clarifies the relation between them. To illustrate the persistent structural links between the political regime and the property regime in today's world, Consider the absence of any democratic mechanism that would allow a majority of citizens of the European Union and a fortiori citizens of the world to adopt a common tax or a redistributive or developmental scheme. This is because each member state, no matter how small its population or what benefits it derives from commercial and financial integration, has the right to veto all forms of fiscal legislation. More generally, inequality today is strongly influenced by the system of borders and national sovereignty, which determines the allocation of social and political rights. This has given rise to intractable multidimensional ideological conflicts over inequality, immigration, and national identity, conflicts that have made it very difficult to achieve majority coalitions capable of countering the rise of inequality. Specifically, ethno-religious and national cleavages often prevent people of different ethnic and national origins from coming together politically, thus strengthening the hand of the rich and contributing to the growth of inequality. The reason for this failure is the lack of an ideology capable of persuading disadvantaged social groups that what unites them is more important than what divides them. I will examine these issues in due course, here I want simply to emphasize the fact that political and property regimes have been intimately related for a very long time. This durable structural relationship cannot be properly analyzed without adopting a long-run transnational historical perspective. Taking Ideology Seriously Inequality is neither economic nor technological. It is ideological and political. This is no doubt the most striking conclusion to emerge from the historical approach I take in this book. In other words, the market and competition, profits and wages, capital and debt, skilled and unskilled workers, natives and aliens, tax havens and competitiveness, none of these things exist as such. All are social and historical constructs, which depend entirely on the legal, fiscal, educational, and political systems that people choose to adopt and the conceptual definitions they choose to work with.
These choices are shaped by each society's conception of social justice and economic fairness and by the relative political and ideological power of contending groups and discourses. Importantly, this relative power is not exclusively material. It is also intellectual and ideological. In other words, ideas and ideologies count in history. They enable us to imagine new worlds and different types of society. Many paths are possible. This approach runs counter to the common conservative argument that inequality has a basis in nature. It is hardly surprising that the elites of many societies in all periods and climes have sought to naturalize inequality. They argue that existing social disparities benefit not only the poor, but also society as a whole, and that any attempt to alter the existing order of things will cause great pain. History proves the opposite. Inequality varies widely in time and space, in structure as well as magnitude. Changes have occurred rapidly in ways that contemporaries could not have imagined only a short while before they came about. Misfortune did sometimes follow. Broadly speaking, however, political processes, including revolutionary transformations, that led to a reduction of inequality proved to be immensely successful. From them came our most precious institutions, those that have made human progress a reality, including universal suffrage, free and compulsory public schools, universal health insurance, and progressive taxation. In all likelihood, the future will be no different. The inequalities and institutions that exist today are not the only ones possible, whatever conservatives may say to the contrary. Change is permanent and inevitable. Nevertheless, the approach taken in this book, based on ideologies, institutions, and the possibility of alternative pathways, also differs from approaches sometimes characterized as Marxist, according to which the state of the economic forces and relations of production determines a society's ideological superstructure in an almost mechanical fashion. In contrast, I insist that the realm of ideas, the political ideological sphere, is truly autonomous. Given an economy and a set of productive forces in a certain state of development, supposing one can attach a definite meaning to those words, which is by no means certain, a range of possible ideological, political, and inequality regimes always exists. For instance, the theory that holds that a transition from feudalism to capitalism occurred as a more or less mechanical response to the Industrial Revolution cannot explain the complexity and multiplicity of the political and ideological pathways we actually observe in different countries and regions. In particular, it fails to explain the differences that exist between and within colonizing and colonized regions. Above all, it fails to impart lessons useful for understanding subsequent stages of history. When we look closely at what followed, we find that alternatives always existed and always will. At every level of development, economic, social, and political systems can be structured in many different ways. Property relations can be organized differently, different fiscal and educational regimes are possible, problems of public and private debt can be handled differently, numerous ways to manage relations between human communities exist, and so on. There are always several ways of organizing a society and its constitutive power and property relations. More specifically, today, in the 21st century, property relations can be organized in many ways. Clearly stating the alternatives may be more useful in transcending capitalism than simply threatening to destroy it without explaining what comes next. The study of these different historical pathways, as well as of the many paths not taken, is the best antidote to both the conservatism of the elite and the alibis of would-be revolutionaries who argue that nothing can be done until the conditions for revolution are ripe. The problem with these alibis is that they indefinitely defer all thinking about the post-revolutionary future. What this usually means in practice is that all power is granted to a hypertrophied state. 
which may turn out to be just as dangerous as the quasi-sacred property relations that the revolution sought to overthrow. In the 20th century, such thinking did considerable human and political damage for which we are still paying the price. Today, the post-communist societies of Russia, China, and to a certain extent Eastern Europe, despite their different historical trajectories, have become hypercapitalism's staunchest allies. This is a direct consequence of the disasters of Stalinism and Maoism and the consequent rejection of all egalitarian internationalist ambitions. So great was the communist disaster that it overshadowed even the damage done by the ideologies of slavery, colonialism, and racialism, and obscured the strong ties between those ideologies and the ideologies of ownership and hypercapitalism. No mean feat. In this book, I take ideology very seriously. I try to reconstruct the internal coherence of different types of ideology, with special emphasis on six main categories, which I will call proprietarian, social democratic, communist, trifunctional, slavist, esclavagist, and colonialist ideologies. I start with the hypothesis that every ideology, no matter how extreme it may seem in its defense of inequality, expresses a certain idea of social justice. There is always some plausible basis for this idea, some sincere and consistent foundation from which it is possible to draw useful lessons. But we cannot do this unless we take a concrete rather than an abstract, which is to say a historical and non-institutional approach to the study of political and ideological structures. We must look at concrete societies and specific historical periods and at specific institutions defined by specific forms of property and specific fiscal and educational regimes. These must be rigorously analyzed. We must not shrink from investigating legal systems, tax schedules, and educational resources, the conditions and rules under which societies function. Without these, institutions and ideologies are mere empty shells, incapable of affecting real social change or inspiring lasting allegiance. I am, of course, well aware that the word ideology can be used pejoratively, sometimes with good reason. Dogmatic ideas divorced from facts are frequently characterized as ideological. Yet often it is those who claim to be purely pragmatic who are in fact most ideological in the pejorative sense. Their claim to be post-ideological barely conceals their disdain for evidence, historical ignorance, distorting biases, and class interests. This book will therefore lean heavily on facts. I will discuss the history of inequality in several societies, partly because this was my original specialty, and partly because I am convinced that unbiased examination of the available sources is the only way to make progress. In so doing, I will compare societies which are very different from one another. Some are even said to be exceptional and therefore unsuitable for comparative study, but this is incorrect. I am well placed to know, however, that the available sources are never sufficient to resolve every dispute. From facts alone, we will never be able to deduce the ideal political regime or property regime or fiscal or educational regime. Why? because facts are largely the products of institutions, such as censuses, surveys, tax records, and so on. Societies create social, fiscal, and legal categories to describe, measure, and transform themselves. Hence, facts are themselves constructs. To appreciate them properly, we must understand their context, which consists of complex, overlapping, self-interested interactions between the observational apparatus and the society under study. This, of course, does not mean that these cognitive constructs have nothing to teach us. It means, rather, that to learn from them, we must take this complexity and reflexivity into account. Furthermore, the questions that interest us, which pertain to the nature of the ideal social, economic, and political organization, are far too complex to allow answers to emerge from a simple objective examination of the facts, which inevitably reflect the limitations of past experiences 
and the incompleteness of our knowledge and of the deliberative processes to which we were exposed. Finally, it is entirely conceivable that the ideal regime, however we interpret the word ideal, is not unique and depends on specific characteristics of each society. Collective Learning and the Social Sciences Nevertheless, my position is not one of indiscriminate relativism. It is too easy for the social scientist to avoid taking a stand, so I will eventually make my position clear, especially in the final part of the book, but in so doing I will attempt to explain how and why I reached my conclusions. Social ideologies usually evolve in response to historical experience. For instance, the French Revolution stemmed in part from the injustices and frustrations of the Ancien Régime. The Revolution, in turn, brought about changes that permanently altered perceptions of the ideal inequality regime as various social groups judged the success or failure of revolutionary experiments with different forms of political organization, property regimes, and social, fiscal, and educational systems. What was learned from this experience inevitably influenced future political transformations and so on down the line. Each nation's political and ideological trajectory can be seen as a vast process of collective learning and historical experimentation. Conflict is inherent in the process because different social and political groups have not only different interests and aspirations, but also different memories. Hence, they interpret past events differently and draw from them different implications regarding the future. From such learning experiences, national consensus on certain points can nevertheless emerge, at least for a time. Though partly rational, these collective learning processes nevertheless have their limits. Nations tend to have short memories. People often forget their own country's experiences after a few decades, or else remember only scattered bits, seldom chosen at random. Worse than that, memory is usually strictly nationalistic. Perhaps that is putting it too strongly. Every country occasionally learns from the experiences of other countries, whether indirectly or through direct contact, in the form of war, colonization, occupation, or treaty, forms of learning that may be neither welcome nor beneficial. For the most part, however, Nations form their visions of the ideal political or property regime or just legal, fiscal, or educational system from their own experiences and are almost completely unaware of the experiences of other countries, particularly when they are geographically remote or thought to belong to a distinct civilization or religious or moral tradition or, again, when contact with the other has been violent, which can reinforce the sense of radical foreignness. More generally, collective learning experiences are often based on relatively crude or imprecise notions of the institutional arrangements that exist in other societies, or even within the same country or in neighboring countries. This is true not only in the political realm, but also in regard to legal, fiscal, and educational institutions. The usefulness of the lessons derived from such collective learning experiences is therefore somewhat limited. This limitation is not inevitable, however. Many factors can enhance the learning process, schools and books, immigration and intermarriage, parties and trade unions, travel and encounters, newspapers and other media, to name a few. The social sciences can also play a part. I am convinced that social scientists can contribute to the understanding of ongoing changes by carefully comparing the histories of countries with different cultural traditions, systematically exploiting all available resources, and studying the evolution of inequality and of political and ideological regimes in different parts of the world. Such a comparative, historical, transnational approach can help us to form a more accurate picture of what a better political, economic, and social organization might look like, and especially what a better global society might look like, since the global community is the one political community to which we all belong. Of course, I do not claim that the conclusions I offer throughout the book are the only ones possible,
but they are, in my view, the best conclusions we can draw from the sources I have explored. I will try to explain in detail which events and comparisons I found most persuasive in reaching these conclusions. I will not hide the uncertainties that remain. Obviously, however, these conclusions depend on the very limited state of our present knowledge. This book is but one small step in a vast process of collective learning. I am impatient to discover what the next steps in the human adventure will be. I hasten to add, for the benefit of those who lament the rise of inequality and of identity politics, as well as for those who think that I protest too much, that this book is in no way a book of lamentations. I am an optimist by nature, and my primary goal is to seek solutions to our common problems. Human beings have demonstrated an astonishing capacity to imagine new institutions and develop new forms of cooperation, to forge bonds among millions or hundreds of millions or even billions of people who have never met and will never meet, and who might well choose to annihilate one another rather than live together in peace. This is admirable. What is more, societies can accomplish these feats even though we know little about what an ideal regime might look like and therefore about what rules are justifiable. Nevertheless, our ability to imagine new institutions has its limits. We therefore need the assistance of rational analysis. To say that inequality is ideological and political rather than economic or technological does not mean that it can be eliminated by a wave of some magic wand. It means, more modestly, that we must take seriously the ideological and institutional diversity of human society. We must beware of anyone who tries to naturalize inequality or deny the existence of alternative forms of social organization. It means, too, that we must carefully study in detail the institutional arrangements and legal, fiscal, and educational systems of other countries, for it is these details that determine whether cooperation succeeds or fails and whether equality increases or decreases. Goodwill is not enough without solid conceptual and institutional underpinnings. If I can communicate to you, the listener, a little of my educated amazement at the successes of the past and persuade you that knowledge of history and economics is too important to leave to historians and economists, then I will have achieved my goal. The Sources Used in This Book Inequalities and Ideologies This book is based on historical sources of two kinds. First, Sources that enable us to measure the evolution of inequality in a multidimensional historical and comparative perspective, including inequalities of income, wages, wealth, education, gender, age, profession, origin, religion, race, status, etc., and second, sources that allow us to study changes in ideology, political beliefs, and representations of inequality, and of the economic, social, and political institutions that shape them. Regarding inequality, I rely in particular on the data collected in the World Inequality Database, WID.world. This project represents the combined effort of more than a hundred researchers in 80 countries around the world. It is currently the largest database available for the historical study of wealth and income inequality both within and between countries. The WID.World project grew out of work I did with Anthony Atkinson and Emmanuel Saez in the early 2000s, which sought to extend and generalize research begun in the 1950s and 1970s by Atkinson, Simon Kuznets, and Alan Harrison. This project is based on systematic comparison of available sources, including national accounts data, survey data, and fiscal and estate data. With these data, it is generally possible to go back as far as the late 19th and early 20th centuries, when many countries established progressive income and estate taxes. From the same data, we can also infer conclusions about the distribution of wealth, Taxes invariably give rise to new sources of knowledge and not only to tax receipts and popular discontent.
For some countries, we can push the limits of our knowledge back as far as the late 18th or early 19th centuries. This is true, for instance, of France, where the revolution established an early version of a unified system of property and estate records. By drawing on this research, I was able to set the post-1980 rise of inequality in a long-term historical perspective. This spurred a global debate on inequality, as the interest aroused by the publication in 2013 of Capital in the 21st Century illustrates. The World Inequality Report 2018 continued this debate. People want to participate in the democratic process and therefore demand a more democratic diffusion of economic knowledge, as the enthusiastic reception of the WID.World project shows. As people become better educated and informed, economic and financial issues can no longer be left to a small group of experts whose competence is, in any case, dubious. It is only natural for more and more citizens to want to form their own opinions and participate in public debate. The economy is at the heart of politics. Responsibility for it cannot be delegated any more than democracy itself can. The available data on inequality are unfortunately incomplete, largely because of the difficulty of gaining access to fiscal, administrative, and banking records in many countries. There is a general lack of transparency in economic and financial matters. With the help of hundreds of citizens, researchers, and journalists in many countries, I was able to gain access to previously closed sources in Brazil, India, South Africa, Tunisia, Lebanon, Ivory Coast, Korea, Taiwan, Poland, and Hungary, and, to a lesser extent, China and Russia. One of many shortcomings of my previous book, Capital in the 21st Century, included a too exclusive focus on the historical experience of the wealthy countries of the world, that is, in Western Europe, North America, and Japan, partly because it was so difficult to access historical data for other countries and regions. The newly available data enabled me to go beyond the largely Western framework of my previous book and delve more deeply into the nature of inequality regimes and their possible trajectories. Despite this progress, numerous deficiencies remain in the data from rich countries as well as poor. For the present book, I also collected many other sources and documents dealing with periods, countries, or aspects of inequality not well covered by WID.World, including data about pre-industrial and colonial societies, as well as inequalities of status, profession, education, gender, race, and religion. For the study of ideology, I naturally relied on a wide range of sources— some will be familiar to scholars, minutes of parliamentary debates, transcripts of speeches, and party platforms. I look at the writings of both theorists and political actors to see how inequalities were justified in different times and places. In the 11th century, for example, bishops wrote in justification of the trifunctional society, which consisted of three classes, clergy, warriors, and laborers. In the early 1980s, Friedrich von Hayek published Law, Legislation, and Liberty, an influential neo-proprietarian and semi-dictatorial treatise. In between those dates, in the 1830s, John Calhoun, a Democratic senator from South Carolina and vice president of the United States, justified slavery as a positive good. Xi Jinping's writings on China's neo-communist dream or op-eds published in the Global Times are no less revealing than Donald Trump's tweets or articles in praise of Anglo-American hypercapitalism in the Wall Street Journal or the Financial Times. All these ideologies must be taken seriously, not only because of their influence on the course of events, but also because every ideology attempts, more or less successfully, to impose meaning on a complex social reality. Human beings will inevitably attempt to make sense of the societies they live in, no matter how unequal or unjust they may be. I start from the premise that there is always something to learn from such attempts. Studying them in historical perspective may yield lessons that can help guide our steps in the future. I will also make use of literature. 
which is often one of our best sources when it comes to understanding how representations of inequality change. In Capital in the 21st Century, I drew on classic 19th century novels by Honoré de Balzac and Jane Austen, which offer matchless insights into the ownership societies that flourished in France and England between 1790 and 1840. Both novelists possessed intimate knowledge of the property hierarchies of their time. They had deeper insight than others into the secret motives and hidden boundaries that existed in their day and understood how these affected people's hopes and fears and determined who met whom and how men and women plotted marital strategies. Writers analyzed the deep structure of inequality, how it was justified, how it impinged on the lives of individuals, and they did so with an evocative power that no political speech or social scientific treatise can rival. Literature's unique ability to capture the relations of power and domination between social groups and to detect the way in which inequalities are experienced by individuals exists, as we shall see, in all societies. We will therefore draw heavily on literary works for invaluable insights into a wide variety of inequality regimes. In Destiny and Desire, the splendid fresco that Carlos Fuentes published in 2008, a few years before his death, we discover a revealing portrait of Mexican capitalism and endemic social violence. In This Earth of Mankind, published in 1980, Pramodia Tour shows us how the inegalitarian Dutch colonial regime worked in Indonesia in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. His book achieves a brutal truthfulness unmatched by any other source. In Americana, 2013, Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie offers us a proud, ironic view of the migratory routes her characters Ifemelu and Obinza follow from Nigeria to the United States and Europe providing unique insight into one of the most important aspects of today's inequality regime. To study ideologies and their transformations, I also make systematic and novel use of the post-election surveys that have been carried out since the end of World War II in most countries where elections are held. Despite their limitations, these surveys offer an incomparable view of the structure of political, ideological, and electoral conflict from the 1940s to the present, not only in most Western countries, including France, the United States, and the United Kingdom, to which I will devote special attention, but also in many other countries, including India, Brazil, and South Africa. One of the most important shortcomings of my previous book, apart from its focus on the rich countries, was its tendency to treat political and ideological changes associated with inequality and redistribution as a black box. I proposed a number of hypotheses concerning, for example, changing political attitudes toward inequality and private property owing to world war, economic crisis, and the communist challenge in the 20th century but I never really tackled head-on the question of how inegalitarian ideologies evolve. In the present work, I try to do this much more explicitly by situating the question in a broader temporal and spatial perspective. In doing so, I make extensive use of post-election surveys and other relevant sources. Human Progress, the Revival of Inequality, and Global Diversity now to the heart of the matter. Human progress exists, but it is fragile. It is constantly threatened by inegalitarian and identitarian tendencies. To believe that human progress exists, it suffices to look at statistics for health and education worldwide over the past two centuries. See figure I.1 in the PDF. Average life expectancy at birth rose from around 26 years in 1820 to 72 years in 2020. At the turn of the 19th century, around 20% of all newborns died in their first year, compared with 1% today. The life expectancy of children who reach the age of one has increased from roughly 32 years in 1820 to 73 today.
We could focus on any number of other indicators, the probability of a newborn surviving until age 10, of an adult reaching age 60, or of a retiree enjoying 5 or 10 years of good health. Using any of these indicators, the long-run improvement is impressive. It is, of course, possible to cite countries or periods in which life expectancy declined even in peacetime, as in the Soviet Union in the 1970s or the United States in the 2010s. This is generally not a good sign for the regimes in which it occurs. In the long run, however, there can be no doubt that things have improved everywhere in the world, notwithstanding the limitations of available demographic sources. Footnote. Circa 1820, the life expectancy of a child who survived to the age of one was roughly 30 years in Africa and Asia and 41 in Western Europe, for a global average of about 32. In 2020, it was 56 in sub-Saharan Africa and more than 80 in the wealthiest countries of Europe and Asia, for a world average of about 73. Although these estimates are imperfect, the orders of magnitude are clear. All life expectancies are based on mortality by age and the year considered. The life expectancy of a person born in that year is therefore slightly higher. See the online appendix. People are healthier today than ever before. They also have more access to education and culture. UNESCO defines literacy as the ability to identify, understand, interpret, create, communicate, and compute using printed and written materials associated with varying contexts. Although no such definition existed at the turn of the 19th century, we can deduce from various surveys and census data that barely 10% of the world's population aged 15 and older could be classified as literate compared with more than 85% today. This finding is confirmed by more precise indices, such as years of schooling, which has risen from barely one year two centuries ago to eight years today and to more than 12 years in the most advanced countries. In the age of Austin and Balzac, fewer than 10% of the world's population attended primary school. In the age of Adichia and Fuentes, more than half of all children in the wealthiest countries attend university. What had always been a class privilege is now available to the majority. To gauge the magnitude of these changes, it is also important to note that the world's population is more than 10 times larger today than it was in the 18th century, and the average per capita income is 10 times higher. From 600 million in 1700, the population of the world has grown to more than 7 billion today, while average income, insofar as it can be measured, has grown from a purchasing power of less than 100, expressed in 2020 euros a month in 1700, to roughly 1,000 today. See figure I.2 in the PDF. This is a significant quantitative gain, although it should be noted that it corresponds to an annual growth rate of just 0.8%, extended over three centuries, which proves, if proof were needed, that earthly paradise can be achieved without a growth rate of 5%. Whether this increase in population and average monthly income represents progress as indubitable as that achieved in health and education is open to question, however. It is difficult to interpret the meaning of these changes and their future implications. The growth of the world's population is due in part to the decline in infant mortality and the fact that growing numbers of parents lived long enough to care for their children to the brink of adulthood. If this rate of population growth continues for another three centuries, however, the population of the planet will grow to more than 70 billion which seems neither desirable nor sustainable. The growth of average per capita income has meant a very substantial improvement in standards of living. Three-quarters of the globe's inhabitants lived close to the subsistence threshold in the 18th century compared with less than a fifth today.
People today enjoy unprecedented opportunities for travel and recreation and for meeting other people and achieving emancipation. Yet several issues bedevil the national accounts I rely on to describe the long-term trajectory of average income. Because national accounts deal with aggregates, they take no account of inequality and have been slow to incorporate data on sustainability, human capital, and natural capital. Because they try to sum up the economy in a single figure, total national income, they are not very useful for studying long-run changes in such multidimensional variables as standards of living and purchasing power. Footnote. National income is defined as gross domestic product, GDP, minus capital depreciation, which in practice amounts to 10 to 15 percent of GDP, plus net income from abroad, which can be positive or negative for a given country, but sums to zero globally. I will return several times to the social and political issues raised by national accounts and their various shortcomings, especially in regard to durable and equitable development. Refer to especially Chapter 13. While the progress made in the areas of health, education, and purchasing power has been real, it has masked vast inequalities and vulnerabilities. In 2018, the infant mortality rate was less than 0.1% in the wealthiest countries of Europe, North America, and Asia, but nearly 10% in the poorest African countries. Average per capita income rose to 1,000 euros per month, but it was barely 100 to 200 euros a month in the poorest countries and more than 3,000 to 4,000 a month in the wealthiest. In a few tiny tax havens, which are suspected, rightly, of robbing the rest of the planet, it is even higher, as is also the case in certain petro-monarchies whose wealth comes at the price of future global warming. There has been real progress, but we can always do better, so we would be foolish to rest on our laurels. Although there can be no doubt about the progress made between the 18th century and now, there have also been phases of regression, during which inequality increased and civilization declined. The Euro-American Enlightenment and the Industrial Revolution coincided with extremely violent systems of property ownership, slavery, and colonialism, which attained historic proportions in the 18th, 19th, and 20th centuries. Between 1914 and 1945, the European powers themselves succumbed to a phase of genocidal self-destruction. In the 1950s and 1960s, the colonial powers were obliged to decolonize, while at the same time the United States finally granted civil rights to the descendants of slaves. Owing to the conflict between capitalism and communism, the world had long lived with fears of nuclear annihilation. With the collapse of the Soviet Empire in 1989 to 1991, those fears dissipated. South African apartheid was abolished in 1991 to 1994. Yet soon thereafter, in the early 2000s, a new regressive phase began as the climate warmed and xenophobic identity politics gained a foothold in many countries. All of this took place against a background of growing socioeconomic inequality after 1980 to 1990, propelled by a particularly radical form of neo-proprietarian ideology. It would make little sense to assert that everything that happened between the 18th century and today was somehow necessary to achieve the progress noted earlier. Other paths could have been followed, other inequality regimes could have been chosen. More just and egalitarian societies are always possible. If there is a lesson to be learned from the past three centuries of world history, it is that human progress is not linear. It is wrong to assume that every change will always be for the best, or that free competition between states and among economic actors will somehow miraculously lead to universal social harmony. Progress exists, but it is a struggle, and it depends above all on rational analysis of historical changes and all their consequences, positive as well as negative.
The Return of Inequality Initial Bearings Among the most worrisome structural changes facing us today is the revival of inequality nearly everywhere since the 1980s. It is hard to envision solutions to other major problems such as immigration and climate change if we cannot both reduce inequality and establish a standard of justice acceptable to a majority of the world's people. Let us begin by looking at a simple indicator, the share of the top decile, that is, the top 10%, of the income distribution in various places since 1980. If perfect social equality existed, the top decile share would be exactly 10%. If perfect inequality prevailed, it would be 100%. In reality, it falls somewhere between these two extremes, but the exact figure varies widely in time and space. Over the past few decades, we find that the top decile's share has risen almost everywhere. Take, for example, India, the United States, Russia, China, and Europe. The share of the top decile in each of these five regions stood at around 25 to 35% in 1980, but by 2018 had risen to between 35 and 55%. See figure I.3 in the PDF. How much higher can it go? Could it rise to 55 or even 75% over the next few decades? Note, too, that there is considerable variation in the magnitude of the increase from region to region, even at comparable levels of development. The top decile share has risen much more rapidly in the United States than in Europe and much more in India than in China. When we look more closely at the data, we find that the increase in inequality has come at the expense of the bottom 50% of the distribution, whose share of total income stood at about 20-25% in 1980 in all five regions, but had fallen to 15-20% in 2018, and indeed as low as 10% in the United States, which is particularly worrisome. Footnote. For the purposes of figure I.3 and in the remainder of the book unless otherwise specified, Europe is defined as the European Union plus allied countries such as Switzerland and Norway with a total population of 540 million, roughly 420 million of whom live in Western Europe, 120 million in Eastern Europe, and 520 million in the European Union as such, including the United Kingdom. Russia, Ukraine, and Belarus are not included. If attention is focused on Western Europe alone, the difference from the United States is even more marked. If we take a longer view, we find that the five major regions of the world represented in figure I.3 in the PDF enjoyed a relatively egalitarian phase between 1950 and 1980 before entering a phase of rising inequality since then. The egalitarian phase was marked by different political regimes in different regions, communist regimes in China and Russia, and social democratic regimes in Europe and, to a certain extent, in the United States and India. We will be looking much more closely at the differences among these various political regimes in what follows, but for now, we can say that all favored some degree of socioeconomic equality which does not mean that other forms of inequality can be ignored. If we now expand our view to include other parts of the world, we see that inequalities were even greater elsewhere. See figure I.4 in the PDF. For instance, the top decile claimed 54% of total income in sub-Saharan Africa and as much as 65% in South Africa, 56% in Brazil, and 64% in the Middle East, which stands out as the world's most inegalitarian region in 2018, almost on a par with South Africa. There, the bottom 50% of the distribution earns less than 10% of total income. Footnote. The estimates for the Middle East and other regions should be considered as lower bounds, given that income amassed in tax havens cannot be accurately accounted for. For alternative estimates, refer to Chapter 13, 
The Middle East is defined here as the region extending from Egypt to Iran and Turkey to the Arabian Peninsula, with a population of roughly 420 million. The causes of inequality vary widely from region to region. For instance, the historical legacy of racial and colonial discrimination and slavery weighs heavily in Brazil and South Africa, as well as in the United States. In the Middle East, more modern factors are at play. Petroleum wealth and the financial assets into which it has been converted are concentrated in very few hands thanks to the workings of global markets and sophisticated legal systems. South Africa, Brazil, and the Middle East stand at the frontier of modern inequality, with top decile shares of 55 to 65 percent. Despite deficiencies in the available historical data, moreover, it appears that inequality in these regions has always been high. They never experienced a relatively egalitarian social democratic phase, much less a communist one. To sum up, inequality has increased in nearly every region of the world since 1980, except in those countries that have always been highly inegalitarian. In a sense, what is happening is that regions that enjoyed a phase of relative equality between 1950 and 1980 are moving back toward the inegalitarian frontier, albeit with large variations from country to country. The Elephant Curve A Sober Debate About Globalization The revival of within-country inequality after 1980 is by now a well-established and widely recognized phenomenon. There is, however, no agreement on what to do about it. The key question is not the level of inequality, but rather its origin and justification. For instance, it is perfectly possible to argue that the level of income inequality was kept artificially and excessively low under Russian and Chinese communism before 1980. Hence, there is nothing wrong with the growing income inequality observed since then. Inequality has actually stimulated innovation and growth for the benefit of all, especially in China, where the poverty rate has decreased dramatically. But to what extent is this argument correct? Care is necessary in evaluating the data. Was it justifiable, for example, for Russian and Chinese oligarchs to capture so much natural wealth and so many formerly public enterprises in the period 2000 to 2020, especially when those oligarchs frequently failed to demonstrate much talent for innovation, except when it came to inventing legal and fiscal stratagems to secure the wealth they appropriated? To fully answer this question, one cannot simply say that there was too little inequality prior to 1980. A similar argument could be made about India, Europe, and the United States, namely that equality had gone too far in the period 1950 to 1980 and had to be curtailed for the sake of the poor. Here, however, the problems are even greater than in the case of Russia or China, even if this argument were partly correct, would it justify a priori any level of inequality whatsoever without so much as a glance at the data? Growth rates in both Europe and the United States were higher, for example, in the egalitarian period, 1950 to 1980, than in the subsequent phase of rising inequality. This casts doubt on the argument that greater inequality is always socially useful. After 1980, inequality increased more in the United States than in Europe, but this did not lead to a higher rate of growth, much less benefit the bottom 50% of the income distribution, whose standard of living stagnated in absolute terms and fell sharply compared to that of top earners. In other words, overall growth of national income decreased in the United States, as did the share of the bottom half. In India, Inequality increased much more sharply after 1980 than in China, but India's growth rate was lower so that the bottom 50% was doubly penalized by both a lower growth rate and a decreased share of national income. Clearly, then, the argument that the income gap between high and low earners had been compressed too much in the period 1950 to 1980, thus calling for a corrective, 
has its shortcomings. Nevertheless, it should be taken seriously up to a point, and we will do so in what follows.